Good evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Soon. I'm uh, the director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. And on behalf of the Center at Georgetown University, which is part of the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service, we are very pleased to hold this important conference, the Druze in their adopted lands, in partnership with the American Druze Foundation and the American University of Beirut. This international conference brings together prominent scholars from Europe, the Middle East, and throughout the United States to discuss key social cultural evolutions of the Druze community, both in their countries of origin as well as in the diaspora. Over the next two days, our panelists will be discussing papers that feature a wide range of topics from migration and adaptation to the community to pioneering Druze women. This entire conference is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and will certainly be used as an educational resource on important nuances of the Druze community worldwide for many years to come. This year marks our ninth year as host to the American Druze Foundation Fellowship in Druze and Arab Studies, which was established by the American Druze Foundation, ADF, at our center, CCAS, in 2012. Each year, we choose a fellow to promote specialized social scientific research on Druze communities and research about the collective political and cultural identities of the Arab world within different disciplines, history, political science, sociology, economics, anthropology, and archaeology. We have together tonight our current fellow and fellows of previous years are with us in this conference to talk about their subjects of research. We at CCAS, the center, are truly proud of this partnership model that we have developed with ADF. I'd like to profusely thank Makram Rabah for his incredible efforts to put together this conference and bring researchers from all around the world. The program, as you will see, is full of interesting and exciting sessions, and I hope you will all enjoy it. Before passing it to the Chair of Board of Directors of ADF, uh, Wildfire, I would like to thank the two people who made this conference possible with their dedication and incredible work, Daniel Dirani and Coco Tate. Thank you both so much for all your wonderful work. Wild, thank you for the support of ADF and welcome to Georgetown. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> On behalf of the American Druze Foundation, I would like to welcome you all to this academic conference. We believe that Druze history and culture is worthy of academic research, and the ADF Fellowship at Georgetown is a major step in that direction. A special thanks to the faculty and staff of the <clears throat> Center of Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University and the Department of History and Archaeology at the American University of Beirut for their partnership uh, on this program. Thank you to all the speakers for participating and to all of you for attending, whether in person or virtually. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Makram Rabah. Uh, Makram is one of our partners in organizing this conference. He's a graduate of the American University of Beirut uh, and holds a PhD in history from Georgetown University. He's a Middle Eastern historian with emphasis on Lebanon and the Druze. His recent book, <clears throat> uh, Conflict on Mount Lebanon, the Druze, the Maronites, and Collective Memory, covers collective identities and the Lebanese Civil War. Please join me in welcoming Makram. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Georgetown, for me, is just like UB. It's home. 
And I would like to thank Joseph. I would like to thank Coco and Dana for the incredible work they have put to bring this uh, event together. Originally, when we came up with this idea, this was to build on the first Druze conference that we did in the UB, which was celebrating a thousand years of diversity, one of its kind conference that took place at the UB with the help of the ADF and a number of other entities. And many of the people who are participating here happened to be at the first conference. Originally, the idea, I ran it across my late mentor, one of the greatest historians on the Druze and on the Ottoman Empire, Dr. Abdurrahim Abu Hussein, who passed away last uh, year. And the idea was to try to build and to try to bring together the community of scholars on this. And I think that today, the best uh, uh, reflection of the community of scholars who work on the Druze and the Levant in particular is our dear friend, uh, Professor Michael Province from San Diego. Today, he will be giving us a very important and a very nice lecture. It's about Druze immigrants near and far, Hauran and the Druze towns, villages, and families. When he first ran the idea across me, he said, yes, the Druze of Hauran were originally from Lebanon, and they immigrated. So their first, the first Druze diaspora, in a way, happened to be in Hauran. And today's talk will be uh, on this. Uh, Michael's work has worked extensively on the Great Syrian Revolt, his latest book, The Last Ottoman Generation, is something that you should definitely read. And today's talk, as he has always been, is very exciting and he's a great storyteller and even a greater historian. So I would like to welcome Michael to the podium and I would like to thank him for accepting to do this. Hello, Sahala Fiq. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great honor to be here with you, and I thank my old friend Makram Raba for inviting me, the American Druze Foundation, AUB, and Georgetown, for another wonderful conference, um, and for their enlightened and long-standing support for scholarship. We're, we have a full uh, um, banquet of wonderful papers to look forward to. And I want to note that the new paper, the papers that we will hear uh, this evening and tomorrow are part of a new generation of young scholars uh, who are bringing uh, new perspectives and, and, uh, and new topics and new ideas uh, to, to the, 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 the question of the Druze in, in, their, in their original homelands, in their adopted homelands, and so we have a real treat in store. Um, 23 years ago, does anybody recognize this gentleman? If you don't, you will. Uh, 23 years ago, this was from last spring in the, during the snow in Sueda, um, and this news uh, appeared there. I don't know who made the snowman. I wish I did, but we'll, we'll come back to that. 23 years ago, this coming summer, I was a guest of the American Druze Society on its trip to Jabal Druze, which was and still is uh, one of the, the, the most cherished memories, most memorable experiences of my entire life. Um, and so my title and, and my talk this evening is inspired by the topic of the, of the conference, the Druze and their adopted lands. And the title is, the Druze migrants near and far, the, the Druze of Hauran. It's hard to imagine my life, my, my work as, as a historian, and my personal life without the help and friendship of dear Druze friends over these, these past two and a half decades. So the talk is in the structure of a journey, um, an accidental Druze journey of understanding. Uh, and for evidence in making the arguments, I mean to relate mostly experiences and things that I remember and witnessed and, and memories over the course of these, these decades. Now, Makram, in writing the, 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 drew, the, ca, the, the, the program for the, the conference said, notwithstanding their small number and esoteric dogma, the Druze assimilated seamlessly into the new countries they inhabited. When I read this, I thought of the 29-year-old new Bergermeister of Ostelheim, 
uh, in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, the mayor, that is, Rayane Schibel, who was a refugee from Soweda in 2015, and today is the mayor of this uh, town in Germany. That seems to me to epitomize uh, seamless assimilation. Um, so I think Makram's formulation is especially fitting for our purposes. And I also think that we have to note since we're here in the United States, that the opportunities of Bagramaister Aschebel in, uh, in, in Ostelheim uh, have been shamefully denied to refugees coming to this country uh, from Syria. Uh, and that the number of Syrians who have been admitted to the United States is tiny, infinitesimal, by comparison with the number in Germany Lebanon or Turkey, and that Germany is enriched by such people, and that the United States is made poorer by uh, its unwillingness to harbor them, to bring uh, more refugees here. And this makes me personally sad, really sad, deeply sad, especially when I think about the, the incredibly generous hospitality and kindness that I received as a guest in, in Jabal Hauran uh, as a young man. So I find this shameful. But today, I will argue that Hauran was the original adopted homeland. Let's see if we get another slide there. There we are. Um, and that the migrants adapted to their new homeland coming from Mount Lebanon, coming from the north of Syria, the region around Idlib, uh, in the same way and with the same cultural flexibility and resilience they seem to have brought to other places. And if you visit Jabal Hauran and the families and villages there, you'll, see, you'll be struck, I think, by the differences in the way of life uh, from the Shuf or from Wadi time. And I'll say more about those differences as we, as we go on. Jabal Hauran, Jabal Druz, Jabal Arab was and is a refuge, perhaps the original refuge. Of course, it, 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 there's also the Laja, which is la refuge, uh, obviously. Um, and it's not a, just a physical place of refuge, but also a, a metaphorical and, and a cultural uh, place of refuge that affects all who go there, including me. So I think that becoming a place of refuge for Druze migrants starting about 200 years ago um, and came to be called Jabal Druze for its new residence at that time, um, changed the Druze migrants as much as they changed the place. It changed them and they changed the place they went to. And so I'm arguing here for a history of dialogue and interaction uh, and mutual exchange. And as Makram points out, of adoption of seamless assimil assimilation and coexistence, and also perennially courageous struggles for justice for the people in the region and for Syrians, Lebanese, and all people, actually. And also a history and a spirit of communal leadership and collective responsibility that's a bit different from the social hierarchies of other communities in the region. I'm going to make the argument, like I said, based on the things that I remember. It's also the case that having come, become a refuge for the Druze, it became a refuge in turn for other people. Uh, and they made it a refuge for others from, uh, from Jamal Pasha's dragnet in, in 1918 during the First World War, uh, from people fleeing uh, Ottoman security during the Great War, uh, from people fleeing French mandate uh, oppression during the French mandate, people fleeing Shishakli's uh, authoritarian dictatorship in the 1950s. And of course, obviously, uh, people fleeing the Lebanese civil war in the 1970s and 80s. And then, obviously, since 2011, uh, Soweda has again become a refuge for people from all over Syria, and particularly from the south. Um, and so Soweda and the region is full, once again, of internally displaced people, most of whom are not Duruz. And it's also the case that it's a place where protest and opposition to the Syrian government has continued not only since 2011, but even before 2011, and that this too is a tradition 
that is, is important there. The most recent protest that I'm aware of happened last month uh, when uh, uh, after the speech by President al-Assad uh, during which he, uh, he commemorated or mentioned the earthquake but failed to mention anything about the location of the earthquake because of course this is a region that the government doesn't control. So to discuss the earthquake and, and, and help for the earthquake victims but not mention that they were living in Idlib which of course is also where there is still a tiny and much uh, victimized Druze population. The people who protested in Soweda held up banners and, and placards that said, the government will not divide us and not divide the protesting the lack of mention of Idlib, of Idlib will not divide us and Bashar al-Assad is not the new Sykes-Picot and what they apparently did not say was to make any special claim for their co-religionists who are in that particular region. So um, they spoke from a, a, a general position of, of, of outrage against the government in its neglect uh, in partitioning the country and in support of all of the citizens of the country. Um, one poster said, Aleppo Hama Ladakia Idlib in the heart of Soweda. So, the Syrian Jews are routinely described as pro-government since 2011, but this is clearly incorrect. Uh, and in fact, people there have been courageously and constantly harboring refugees from other parts of Syria and challenging oppression and criminal violence from all quarters, and not just since 2011, but in fact long before. So, <clears throat> um, you might ask, if the Druze were uh, once a vulnerable migrant population in Jabal Druze and, and retained their empathy and support for refugees and vulnerable people, where did they come from originally? Uh, and, and, uh, and what were their original lands? And so this is a topic that I'm not gonna discuss uh, for a few reasons, but one of them is that as a modern historian of the Middle East, I've become and have been instilled in a kind of an allergy for origin stories. And we share this, many of us learned this from Dr. Sal from Dr. Kamal Salibi, who, uh, who made the point that the comparative er origin stories harnessed to contemporary political conflicts is how we got Israelites against Canaanites and Hittites against Armenians and Phoenicians against Arabs and all the rest of these kinds of, so I'm not gonna, go into the origin story. I chose my topic of research 25 years ago because I was looking for revolutionary peasants, because I knew my people were peasants. And so I wanted to find revolutionary peasants and it seemed that the revolutionary peasants were in, were in Hauron. And yet, the French mandate chroniclers and all of, the, all of the historiography that existed dictated that the people who lived there were feudal lords and that they dominated the poor peasants of, of, of Hauran. And yet, there were these continual revolts against outside interference that seemed to unite everybody. And so I thought, well, I want to go and see. And, and I went to Syria as a graduate student in 1998. And I intended to go and visit uh, Soweda and the region, um, but I was intimidated and it was difficult. And there was, there was nowhere to stay, and I knew nobody, and, uh, and there were no restaurants, and there were no hotels. There was only one hotel in, in uh, Soweda, which was called Raudat al-Jabal, and eventually I did spend the night there and almost froze to death, I'm not kidding, uh, on one very icy night. Um, but I was, you know, th there were no buses after dark, uh, coming or going, so, you know, it was a bit, but then, um, I, a, a young man um, suddenly one day turned up at my door and I had the good fortune to meet um, Talal Kamal Rizik, uh, who was to become one of the great uh, friends and, and, uh, and, and companions of my life. Uh, there he is on the, on the right. He was an AUB graduate, is an AUB graduate, and a multilingual polymath and really probably the smartest and most impressive person I think I've ever known. Um, and he's also uh, related to, uh, on, on his mother's side to the Achash family and on his father's side to the Rizik family. Now, Jabal Hauran was a strange place to him. He hadn't spent much time there, but he said, come Michael, we'll go. 
And so we, we went together. Um, and when I went, uh, uh, I, I couldn't believe the reception and the kindness that, uh, that I, I found from people, everyone I met, really. The amount of hospitality and kindness was overwhelming and unbelievable. And I, I learned a lot of things there. I learned first to be polite, to really learn politeness, because this is an important value that people hold uh, dear and don't take uh, lightly. Um, and and uh, I learned also that, uh, that the people who I would meet, including Talal, were the people on whom my future research would depend as a source of, of knowledge and thought and things that they could teach me. My, my roommate, Stefan Weber, who was at that time uh, my roommate and is now, I think, the, a, one of the greater historians of, of Damascus, said, Michael, I think your dissertation just walked through the door. So it was, uh, it was a fortuitous ex uh, experience to meet Talal. I met other people when I went. And after I met Talal, this is in front of uh, Sultan's Modafe. Uh, and this is in front of a wheat field, and that is a, wheat, a stock of wheat on which the entire economy of the region is based, of course, then and now. Um, but I met other people, too. And I went many times after that, and I visited frequently, and people told me again and again, you have to move here. If you want to really know us, if you really want to come to, we want you to come to know us, so you have to move here. But Talal said, don't do it, Michael. Don't do it. Because you'll, you'll never have a free moment. You will never be allowed to eat any meal by yourself. And uh, you will never ha be able to finish your dissertation. So he, he, uh, he talked me out of this. One day, I was walking across a wheat field like this on a path. Uh, and an old man, a very old man, in, in traditional attire, a religious sheikh, came up to me. And he, was, he, was, he ran up to me. I mean, he really ran. Uh, and he, he approached me, and he said, I heard you were here. Now, this was not the kind of greeting I had come to accept, to expect from the, from the people of, of, of the region. You know, it was quite, he was obviously agitated, let's say. And he said, I heard you were here, and I need to talk with you. And I said, okay. He said, you're from Chicago. I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And he said, I said, yes. He said, you've got our books. And I said, not me. And he said, you've got our books. And I said, I don't have the books. And I didn't know about them. And I wouldn't read them because they're your books. And, and, and they're not my books. And he said, well, but you should, you should go get those books and you should return them. Let's go have some coffee. And uh, so this was a, a kind of a, this was one of the experiences that I had during this period of time. Um, of course. As Dr. Salibi uh, inoculated me against origin stories, he also inoculated me against the fascination that foreign scholars often have for the, the secrets of the minority religions. I never read anything about these topics. I'm not particularly interested. I was looking for revolutionary peasants, not, uh, not, not re religious uh, secrets. So I left that aside, and I still leave it aside, and I'll always leave it aside. And even if the books are in Chicago, I'm not reading them. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but what I did become interested in was the, the, the structure, the social structure of the region and how people lived and the things that they, that they did. Uh, the, the, the migrants, when they went from, from, uh, from, from, the, from Lebanon from, and from Wadi time and from uh, northern uh, uh, Syria, they moved into houses that were made from basalt that were as old as, as Roman times. And they occupied these houses uh, as they were, actually. And I've, I've seen, this is, of course, a famous photograph from the Matson collection. But it's also the cover of the, uh, the, the, the wonderful book of our, our, our friend and mentor and teacher, uh, Abdul Rahim Abu Hussein, uh, Bain al-Makar, uh, Marquez wa al-Atraf. Hauran uh, fi al-Wuthaik al-Uthmaniyeh. So this is the, the, the cover that he chose. So this gentleman is opening a door, and I've seen doors like this, and they still turn easily, even though they may weigh many tons. And so this is the, the structure of the region. And of course, when people went there, they had an, a tremendously difficult job to 
uh, clear rocks. This is a wheat field. It's not just grass. And somebody moved all of these rocks out of that field in order to, to, to plow that field. And when you see this, this is in the high mountain. It's quite up high. And over the course of many years, I, I visited, I went everywhere. Uh, and so at one point, I had a car or rented a car and, and made a trip to these. Of course, the place to me is the most beautiful place in the world, especially this time of year uh, in the spring. Um, of course, I'm, I'm very biased, as I would be. I, like I say, it affected me a lot, uh, my time there. Um, so, uh, and this pile here, this is particularly interesting, I think. Now, I don't know who farms these fields. I don't know whose fields these are, but I know that the people who, I don't know how they got those rocks up there, they are huge rocks, they're incredibly large. But I'm almost certain that whoever's fields that those are knows the name of the people who piled up those rocks and is probably related to them, uh, and that uh, those rocks have a story. I wish I knew that story, but um, maybe someday somebody will, will be able to tell us. Um, now, as I said, uh, I, I found, I learned and was looking for the idea of, of rebellious peasants and the people who had taken part in the Great Syrian Revolt. And I learned that, um, that, uh, that the families, and you can see the house of Sultan al Atrash that I showed you a photograph a minute ago. These are not grand houses. And they were, although described by French enemies of the, the, the Druze families as feudal lords, the feudalism was not like feudalism in Europe and, certainly, and not like feudalism in Mount Lebanon. Uh, and in fact, probably wasn't like feudalism at all. And, and I noticed when I went there uh, that there was very little in the way of luxury and very well, little in the way of, of tremendous uh, poverty among the people who would live in these villages. And that every family, the great families, all the great families had had comparatively wealthy branches and comparatively poor branches. And the distance between these branches was not large. Uh, it, was, it was small. Uh, and, and so this was an interesting observation, which is echoed by things that I read later on as well. The rich families of the big, fam of the big cities and the Shouf and coastal mountains, for that matter, probably deserved to be called feudalist. And over the years, I've visited grand palaces in Damascus, Aleppo, Beirut, uh, Tripoli, Saida, and Mokhtara, of course, in the last Druze conference. Uh, and those ways of life and the palaces reflect a culture of the 19th century, which I think owes much to Istanbul, to the imperial overarching framework, to the culture of the imperial capital, to the culture of Paris, and the, the houses of the great families in, in, uh, in, in Jabal Hauran owe nothing to this, uh, and much more to the culture of the people that they came to live amongst, which is to say settled uh, and partly nomadic uh, Bedouin of, of Hauran uh, in the 18th and 19th century. And the things that people eat and the way that they behave and the culture that they practice owes much to the people who who lived there before, who also, of course, have interacted with them uh, tremendously. So coffee is important. Uh, and it's, of course, not the kind of coffee that people drink in the cities at all. It takes all day to make it. You drink it in a tiny cup. Everybody uses the same cup. Everyone knows this, uh, this, uh, this important uh, uh, tradition. And you get it the moment you walk in, unless you get water first if it's very hot. And uh, all of these things are absolutely uh, uh, required. There, uh, there, there's no diff there's no uh, divergence, um, and so I, with Talal, I visited um, eventually. Uh, the first time we went in front of the Madafe, I was not able to visit, but eventually I was able to visit Mansur Sultan Al Atrash, the son of the man depicted in the snowman uh, at the beginning, um, and I found that uh, that. He was a tremendously generous and kind person who was taught me a great deal. Um, and also his daughter, uh, the esteemed historian Rima Latrash, uh, who, who um, uh, I met both in Damascus and in al Qurayya in their village. Uh, Ustaz Mansour was more relaxed in, in, uh, in Qurayya than he was in Damascus, for sure. 
Uh, at, in, in, uh, in Damascus, he was wearing trousers. In, in Karaya, he was wearing a jalabiya. In Damascus, the coffee was Turkish coffee. In Al Karaya, the, the, uh, the, the coffee was, was Arab coffee. Um, and he said many times, we live in stone houses, but otherwise we're, I, our culture is identical to the Bedouin. Uh, and when we were exiles during the revolt from 1927 to 1937, we lived in tents, and it was a hardship for us. And we didn't like to live in tents. And, and he, made this, he said this many times, I heard him say this, about, about uh, the, the, the circumstances uh, of that time. He didn't seem to me like the son of a feudal lord. And some years later, I received, after he passed away, I got a, a, I got a copy of his memoirs from a Syrian friend who brought it to me. And there's a photograph in the, the, the memoir of, of Mansour as a young man sitting on a tractor, waving, uh, plowing a wheat field. And I wondered to myself when I saw this, the sons of feudal lords don't plow their own fields. Now, he wasn't plowing it behind a donkey as many people still do in this region. Uh, he did have a tractor, but not many feudal, the children of feudal lords plow wheat fields on their summer school holidays. Uh, so I thought this was an interesting uh, point. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> in the summer of 2000, I was invited to accompany the American Druze Society on its trip to, to the Jabal. And I don't know, I was living in Damascus at this time, and I don't know how I, I lucked into this trip. Uh, it's not clear to me. These are more photographs of agriculture, which was, my, was and is my interest. Um, but I don't think I'll be giving anything away by saying that as impressed as I had always been with the tremendous hospitality that people had showed me, it wasn't anything like what the community rolled out for brothers and sisters from Lebanon and from America in 2000. So this was really something. And I, we drove around in a bus. We were taken everywhere, and we met everybody. Uh, the American Druze uh, Foundation uh, trustee, Hassan Saab, was there. And, and we've been in touch ever since. Um, uh, we went to, uh, to Sultan's Memorial. Uh, this was before it was uh, the big memorial was built. That's a photograph that Hassan sent me not too long ago front of the memorial in Kraya, in, right in front of Sultan's house, the Madafe. Um, now, we heard speeches, um, and, and uh, like I say, Hassan shared these photos with me. For 20 years, I didn't see them. Um, and the speeches were quite interesting. There was a bit of criticism of the Syrian government, which was more brave than I heard from anyone else during the, the two and a half years I spent there. Um, there was, uh, there was um, also a few speeches that were critical, or at least, you know, there were a few old fellows who couldn't resist the opportunity to give some Americans and some Lebanese a piece of their mind. Uh, that happened, too, during the course of their time. And then we went and ate a mansaf, which was, well, not this big, bigger, like a, a billiard table big. Uh, and there were no utensils. And there were, and we ate it with our hands. They would give you forks if you insisted, but you had to insist. Now, this was an interesting experience for me. And some, a couple years later, I had the incredible uh, privilege to be a guest uh, of, oops, these are photographs of Sultan, and Wadi Sirhan or Azraq, which I wanted to show you. And this one, and then this is the photograph from the 2002 Druze uh, Heritage Foundation Conference in, in, uh, at Oxford. Um, now, during the course of this conference, which was a, a great, the, many of these people are no longer with us, unfortunately. This is the real leading lights of, of our field uh, at, at this time, and I was a youngster. Some of my is over there, too. We were the two youngsters. Um, it was a heady experience, I must tell you. Um, and Dr. Salibi wrote an article about Rustam Haidar, the, 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 uh, the, the Iraqi uh, um, statesman and ally of King Faisal, uh, where he discussed 
uh, Rostam Haidar's very ethnog ethnographical description of the Jabal as a, as a refugee fleeing in 1918 uh, from, from, uh, from the Ottoman collapse and from uh, the Ottoman um, uh, security. And it was an extraordinary thing to, to hear Dr. Salibi talk about how Rostam Haidar's experiences echoed my own uh, 100 years, almost 100, a little less than 100 years later. He said that Rustam Haidar had been a guest of the young Sultan Al-Atrash, uh, who at that time was, a, was an orphan. His father had been executed. And he said that Sultan Al-Atrash was a personification of, of the, 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 the virtues of boundless hospitality, its valor, and the aura of grandeur and dignity it exuded. And he also talked about coffee and how, as a man of Istanbul and Paris, Rustam Haidar was educated in both places, he didn't like the idea that 20 lips touched the same cup of coffee. And then he ate the mansaf, and he said, thank God for, for soap. Uh, so this was a, a similar kind of a, an experience. Um, now, um, I'm going to conclude here in a second. I can bring this photograph. Oh, that's not what I, let's see if we can, if it's on a loop. There we are. The first time I met um, uh, Mansur al-Atrash, um, do you remember the, the, the sheikh who chased me across the field? Well, the first time I met Mansur, Ustaz Mansur, he asked me a similar kind of a question, but much more sophisticated. And of course, he was an AUB graduate, and he asked his question in his perfect uh, AUB English, despite the, the the, the, the lull of many decades, and he said, we don't like America, uh, and we don't like most Americans, but we like the good ones. I haven't met many good ones. Are you a good one? And I spent years uh, trying to prove that I was worthy, uh, and I know that always I was much, much more impressed with him than he was ever impressed with me. Uh, and I don't know, I hope that he eventually decided in my favor, um, but he was always kind and patient with my dumb questions and, and, uh, and, and endlessly generous with me. Now this portrait of his father has been on my mantle for some years, uh, and I, I'm, I'm very fond of it. Uh, and this was also taken during the exile in Wadi Sirhan. Um, and at some point, this is in the category of seamless assimilation, at some point, uh, she moved, my wife moved it off the mantle for, to replace it in place of holiday decorations. And after the holiday was over, I said, can, can Sultan's portrait come back? And she said, of course it can come back. He's a member of the family which seems to me to be seamless assimilation, but we don't know who's assimilating whom. Thank you. So I think, I think uh, maybe Makram will, will tell me what to do now. It happened to me that I lived in uh, Syria and in Lebanon for some time. Basically, what really intrigues me in some way, somehow, the word of usage of Jabal Hawran. As much as the English people are having allergy of the Irish, we do have the Druze people have a problem with the name of Hawran in general. Hauran is a great place, great people, but basically it was given to the Druze, uh, I think in a, uh, an error that was said that Jabal Hauran, there was the mountain of the Druze, it was the mountain, but since the plains are Hauran, 
they said Jabal Hauran. But I would like to have a small correction for the future research. This is Jabal al-Duruz or Jabal al-Arab. That's basically how we would like to be addressed. Jabal Hauran to us is a little bit allergic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I guess I, I just uh, tried to I tried to use a, a geographical term as opposed to a because I know that uh, you know in Syria, of course, uh, after the 60s, it became officially known as Jabal al-Arab, and uh, and that this is, of course is a reflection of contemporary Syrian politics and the de-emphasis of anything that symbolizes uh, religious difference. Uh, so uh, my thought was to uh, not, certainly not to uh, offend anyone's sensibilities, uh, but rather to go back to a geographical term as opposed to a term that has uh, any kind of contemporary political ramifications. But I, I, I'm happy to have the correction, thank you. Well, thank you. My, my name is uh, Maj Algatrif, Majd Algatrif Bil Arabi. Uh, I'm actually from Sweden, uh, and I would like to back you up, uh, Mike. I had a different question, but in terms of uh, Jabal Hauran, so in, in 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 Latin, it's Orantes, which is the mountain. Batania was the meadows, and Trachonitis was the lejet. So it is the mount. Mount Hauran is is from Orantes, which is the land of the caves. So that is where take the mountain that it's from, uh, the name from. Now, because of the uh, ethnic differences, Hauran is now referred to the meadows, and we disowned the name. But for you, if you name the geography, it will be Jabal Hauran. The Jabal, Jabal Druze or Jabal Arab is the ethnographic name of the mountain. So, so thanks for that. Uh, Dr. Qais Ferro, he used Hauran all the time, and he's Druze. Um, so, um, uh, so that's the follow-up on you. But I understand the, the grievances behind it. Um, uh, I don't know if you've read, uh, I'm sure you've read uh, Reverend Porter trip to Hauran in the 1860s. Um, and there he visited a village, and he had the same experience with food. But he recorded that, and it was, for me, a bit enlightening. I expected that um, mensaf is our signature food, that I should see it at those times. But he described that he was hosted by uh, Amr, uh, village, they are the, kind of the feudal lords of the north. And he's, he was served pilaf, rice pilaf. And he knew bulgur because he described mensaf. He described another secondary dish that was that. Um, and then that he was handed a spoon. <laughs> and that's 1860. Uh, and just kind of for the assimilation process, kind of people who came to um, uh, Mount Hauran at that time, uh, they came from three regions, from Halab, Idlib, Halabi, uh, from Mount Lebanon, and from Northern Palestine, called them Safadi. Um, and they came from mostly, kind of, a lot of them from urban settings. So, th so there was a back assimilation into the culture, which is the nomadic culture, with the, with the Mensaf being adopted later on. It was not an indigenous food for the first settlers. Um, so we, we a bit went backwards, but now we use spoons. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Spoons, spoons, are, spoons are overrated, I must say. I, I was very happy to eat with my hands. I, I will eat with my hands at every opportunity. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Dima de Clerc. I would like, I was very interested in when you, when you talked about, uh, you know, feud, feudalism in Lebanon, which is different than in uh, uh, Jabal Huran. And, uh, but you didn't say why. I mean, in, in, in what way it is different, and which is different, of course, than European feudalism. Actually, we, we call it iqta' in Lebanon to make the difference. And, uh, even in English, when we write it, we write it ikta because there's a difference, and it's an enormous difference in which uh, uh, people were not uh, slaves. I mean, were not uh, uh, 
served, right. exactly. So this is a, a, a huge difference. But, and I would like to know more about Huran and what it is, uh, again, different than the Lebanese one. Yeah. The second thing is um, I'd like to know more about this uh, assumption or this assertion that you have about uh, the, the Druze in Huran uh, really being uh, anti-Assad. And uh, well, because I have a lot of information and I know that there had been a lot of problems with uh, Walid Jumblad because of this and they wanted their own autonomy and they wanted to be a self uh, determ I mean, to have self-determination and they did not at all follow his, um, well, I would say his uh, um, advice, but m more of a, of, a, of a dictate right. uh, to um, actually, uh, Move along with the uh, with the Thawra and with the revolution, and they refused. So, uh, thank you for letting me know a little bit more about that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, so I, I can say a little bit more about. I mean, there, you know, this is something I've been thinking about for 25 years. So there's a lot of things that I didn't say, more, many more things that I didn't say than that what I did. Um, so. One thing that I think is useful to, to mention is that um, there was a master's thesis by a young man named Ramez Tome, uh, who is now an old man, uh, in the AUB in, at AUB in the 70s. Ramez uh, was the son of the Syrian uh, ambassador to the UN during the 67 war. And so he had access to um, documents that no one has ever had access to before or since, which is namely the, the land appropriation records of the United Arab Republic at the time of, of Abdel Nasser. So what these documents show is that the, the families of Damascus, the Kowatlis, the, the, the Mardambes, and so on, the Azams, had thousands and thousands of hectares of agricultural land. They owned entire villages uh, and essentially owned the people in those villages at some times as well. Uh, and that much of this land was in the Ghuta, so it was irrigated, valuable farmland close to markets. There are no Druze in those land appropriation records. So what that means is that they didn't have enough m land, and it's not good land. <laughs> I mean, the pictures are clear. If it doesn't rain, they don't eat. And if it doesn't rain, there's no harvest. And so, you know, they go higher and higher up the mountain, m but it's very difficult agricultural terrain. And there's no, there's no surface water. There's, the rain is 300 uh, uh, millimeters in the north, 200 in the south. It's not a lot. Uh, and, and, and that's it. And they still didn't have big enough plots. And I'm talking about all the families, the Atrash, the Hamdan, the, the Abu Asaf, the Halabi, all of them. None of them had big enough holdings to qualify for appropriation, OK? So that's what I mean when I say that this is not a, a wealthy feudal community. There's no feudalism. It's it's uh, it's it's the land is is uh, is 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 widely distributed, uh, marginally productive, and this is the reason also that there's a huge degree of 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 or a very small degree of social differentiation we can say between the richest and the poorest. It's not a big gap. So this is this is what I meant. Um, I think I I. Maybe I forgot the second part of your question. Or... Oh, well, yeah, so this is, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, this is an argumentative region. <laughs> People like to argue. Uh, and, you know, there's, in the years that I spent in Syria, I never heard, I mean, people were really afraid of criticizing the government, but not there. And, and so I, you know, they would, people would say things that you couldn't say anywhere else in Syria, as far as I could, I was aware of. And, and so the, the, as far as the, the, the participation in the, in the revolution, I think obviously the community is split and there's lots of people who are at least sympathetic to the original aims of, of, the, of the uprising in 2011. Uh, and so, you know, and, I, and as I mentioned from a month ago, uh, they're still out in public, in the square, in the middle of Sueda, with placards and their faces. Uh, so this is not a small thing, actually. 
And, and so I think that, you know, the, the idea of a, of a unified uh, support for, the, for, the, for, for Bashar al-Assad is, 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 uh, is not correct. Uh, so does that, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, through your presentation, I felt like we all got an opportunity to learn a lot about your experience in Hauran through your lens, and I understand that. But I was wondering if we can maybe ask you a little bit about the, uh, the consequence of this maybe ambivalent assimilation that you were suggesting in the end. Um, and I understand why you're pushing back against this idea of origin stories for their possible kind of larger mythological consequence and identity. Right. But I mean, through your research and through your experience, aren't there certain ways, maybe through genealogical traditions and records, where Druze living in this area have a sense of where they're coming from geographically and have a better idea and understanding of influence and if it's as unilateral or bilateral as you're suggesting? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I mean, I, I'm, I did for the purposes of, of trying to be, you know, um, more maybe uh, uh, entertaining before dinner, you know, I, I sort of I sort of dialed back on the scholarly uh, discussions that that I might do uh, at different times. So, of course, the Druze migrants displaced the people who were living in those villages. Many of the villages were only uh, only occupied temporarily uh, or seasonally, um, and so when people came, I mean, there was a migration in probably the again during the time of the Crusades, but it was temporary. They left apparently, uh, but during the 18th century, uh, starting in the time of uh, of uh, Ahmed uh, Pasha Jezar and after. Uh, people came and they stayed permanently. And they, at first, they paid tribute to the, to the Bedouin. And then they were able to not pay tribute to the Bedouin. And then they demanded tribute from the Bedouin in some cases. And, and they displaced them in some cases, and in some cases they, they, they coexisted. Now, the coexistence, I mean, I was living in Syria when there was a war between Bedouin and Druze in the Jabal that I basically witnessed. Uh, and it was, you know, kind of, it was all very hush-hush and secret and not discussed. The government seized the entire region, or uh, sealed it. You couldn't get in and out, you know. I would call people on the phone. The phone would answer in the Mohabarat office. It wouldn't go to my friend's house. So, I mean, you know, uh, so these tensions are, they exist since forever uh, between the Hawarna and the, and the Druze. Um, but, you know, there's also a great deal of, 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 uh, of, of, of interaction and coexistence, and it's also the case that, that, that the region is full of people who are displaced from Dara, and they're living in outside Suede, they're not in a good way, but they are there. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a long story of, of interaction, competition, um, coexistence, uh, moments of great tension, which are usually diffused communally without the intervention of the government, uh, it's never been a good <laughs> experience for the people of the region, whether it's the Ottoman government, the French government, or the, or the Syrian government. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the long story. So, I mean, I hope I, that's a more satisfying answer than what I, what I gave you during the course of the talk.